Hello, Lighthouse. It's good to be with you and worship with you today. And before we start our service, it's just a reminder that we're going to be taking communion together later on in the service after the sermon. So make sure that you have your bread and your juice ready as we start our service. The theme for today's message will be on how Jesus changes our loneliness and isolation. And maybe now more than ever, we feel the difficulty of being distant from people. We feel the burden of running this race of COVID-19 alone, and we long to run it with others. So our call to worship today reminds us that we're not alone. Hebrews 12 paints this picture of us running the race of the Christian life together, pressing on towards our Savior together. And while we are sheltering in place at home, we are still joined together by the blood of Christ. So here's our call to worship from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So even as you're participating in the service today in your home, realize that we're running together. We're not singing alone. We're not giving alone. We're not hearing the word of God alone. We're not taking communion alone. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses running the race and looking to Jesus together. Let's start our worship service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've called us into this great race and you've called us to run it not alone as sole participants, but you have called us to be part of this massive army of followers, this massive crowd of believers, a cloud of witnesses that is all mutually pursuing you and we get to do it together. And we are in a season where that unity feels strained and stretched, and yet we know that nothing can separate us from your love and nothing can separate us from the love of our brothers and sisters. So God, today especially, as we join together in worship, would you allow us to understand and perceive the fact that we are united together by the blood of Christ. Would you be honored in this worship service? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
of deliverance, how unwavering our hope, Christ in power resurrected, as we will be when He comes.
We want to continue to worship through the giving of our offering. This is one of the ways that we are joined together as a church family as we give together for our shared ministry in the gospel. So take some time now to give online or through our church center app. Let's pray for our offering together. Heavenly Father, it is a privilege to give because you have been so lavishly generous to us. Uh, we are in a position where we have experienced uh, just immense spiritual blessing from you, that we are your children, that we are forgiven of our sins. We've been adopted into a heavenly family, that we have an inheritance that will, is unfading and will last for all of eternity. And out of that storehouses of riches that you have given to us, God, we now take our offerings and we offer them to you. And we ask that you would use them for your gospel purposes. We also ask that you would continue to meet the needs of those in our church um, that are strained and stretched by this time. And we pray, God, that you would continue to provide for them everything that they need for life and for godliness. And we pray that we as a church community would rally around those who are in need. That part of the, one of the ways that we are able to be joined together is by meeting the needs of our church family. So would you allow our generosity at this time to be one of the ways that we're able to live out this unity that we have together in Christ. Lord, we thank you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. skill or name in win or lose in pride or shame but in the blood of Christ that flows at the cross I will trust in my Redeemer greatest treasure wellspring of trust in him no other my soul is satisfied in him alone as summer flowers we fade and die fame youth and beauty hurry by life eternal calls to us at the cross. I will not boast in wealth or might or human wisdom's fleeting light, but I will boast in knowing Christ at the cross. trust in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. And I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. in my Redeemer, greatest 
Rich treasure, wellspring of my soul. And I would trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. And I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure. Trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. We have a few announcements before we get into God's Word this morning. And if you're new to Lighthouse, we are so thankful that you're part of this worship service. Maybe you found us randomly on YouTube. Uh, maybe your friends or family invited you. Maybe your roommate has us on in your living room and you just can't escape the sound of my voice. Either way, you are here for a reason. And we'd love to hear from you and get to know you. So please head on over to our website and our new to Lighthouse page and you can fill out our online communication card. And we would be honored if we can meet you and get to know you better. We also have our next Zoom prayer gathering happening in two Mondays. The first one last month was such a huge blessing and we're already looking forward to pursuing the Lord together in prayer. And next Sunday is going to be special for a few reasons. We'll have a message on how Jesus changes marriage. We really want this time to be a season of growth and maturity for the marriages in our church. It's also Mother's Day and we'll have something special for the moms in our church. So you can invite the mothers in your life to join us for worship that day. And we're also gonna try something new next week after service. One of the things that we miss about meeting together is obviously the times of fellowship on a Sunday. Do you remember what that was like? The, the mad rush to grab your snacks and your kids, maybe in that order, loitering in the fellowship hall, running into people randomly, seeing two minute conversations turn into hour long moments. And while we obviously can't have that same experience now, we wanted to try to create some space for us to fellowship together on a Sunday after service. So we're introducing our first after service fellowship. After our nine o'clock and 11 o'clock services next Sunday, we're gonna have very small 20 minute Zoom fellowship hangouts. We'll be able to catch up with old friends and get to know some new ones. And whether you're new to Lighthouse, a regular attender or a member, we're hoping that this is gonna be a great way for us to continue to build relationships. If you'd like to be a part of next week's after service fellowship, make sure you sign up sometime this week on our website. Well, that concludes our announcements. Let's turn to God's word with Pastor Kim. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you and we praise you. You are good and you are gracious. And though we are in a season apart, we thank you that you are a God who draws near. And so Lord, as we think about loneliness this morning, help us to draw near to you right now through your word. Speak to us, Lord, we are listening. We thank you, we praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning, Lighthouse. I do miss you, but I'm thankful for the opportunity that we have to worship and think through God's word together. Now, before we get into this, I, I do wanna warn you that the notes are more extensive than usual. So if you haven't printed up the notes, it might be a good idea to pause the video now and print them up. Uh, you can find a link below the video. We've been in a series called Jesus Changes Everything. It was initially a series for Easter, but it's become something more as we continue to consider how Jesus really does change everything, even in a season of COVID-19 and safer at home. Now this unique season, I'm sure that like many of you, uh, I've noticed my heart praying more fervently for certain groups of people, those in the healthcare industry, families with children who have special needs, those affected financially, the elderly and those with compromised immune systems, those who have family who are sick, uh, and for me, one particular group I've been praying for is those struggling with loneliness. My heart is heavy for those of you who are hurting in isolation right now. And so I wanted to talk about that today, loneliness and isolation. As you can imagine, it's a pretty relevant topic in this season of Safer at Home. Now, right away, some of you may object that I am like the, the last guy who should be addressing loneliness. First of all, I'm quarantined with five other people, not exactly the recipe for loneliness. In fact, my wife jokingly said, after you do the message on isolation, are you going to do one for people who feel like they could use some isolation? Beyond that, 
I've made the joke often that I don't have FOMO, fear of missing out. I have phobia, fear of being invited. So I'm not really the person who feels like they, they need to be with people all the time. But actually, I think this right away brings up some fallacies concerning loneliness. That it's about things like proximity to people or personality. But understand, loneliness is much more pervasive than that. And I would argue that all of us experience moments, if not seasons, of loneliness. So what is loneliness? We're going to define loneliness as the pain of feeling isolated or not connected with others. Now, even in that definition, we broaden a bit who we are talking about. Because you might not consider yourself lonely, but you might say, I feel isolated or I'm having trouble connecting. Or I feel out of place or I don't feel like I have a place to call home or I feel remote. But we're going to call that lonely. And needless to say, it's a pressing topic right now. Because social distancing and safer at home has really exasperated the loneliness that some people feel. I've talked to more than one of our singles who are, who are really struggling because they don't have family around them and yet they can't be with their friends. And so their loneliness has become even more acute in, in this season. Now, single or not, I'm guessing many of you are feeling the loneliness of this season. And yet I think we'd be remiss if we assumed that loneliness was only about those who are alone. Because, and this is really important to understand, loneliness and aloneness are not the same thing. Aloneness is about not having others around. Loneliness is the pain of feeling isolated. The difference being, you can be alone and not feel lonely, and you can be with others and feel alone. Have you ever walked into a room full of people but not known anyone, and so you feel lonely? So loneliness and aloneness often go hand in hand but again, they're not the same thing. In fact, I'm sure that some of the lonelier people in our church have people around them all the time. One example of this would be marriages. Marriage can be a lonely place. If your marriage is struggling, if your spouse seems distant or cold, or they don't seem to understand you, or if there's no intimacy, it can feel very, very lonely. If you're single, this may boggle your mind, but believe me when I say some of the loneliest people in our church are married. I mean, just imagine sleeping next to someone who hasn't said they love you for years or who shows little kindness and care. Imagine feeling stuck married to a person you feel no affection for. Imagine living with someone who has hurt you more than any other person has ever hurt you. Again, it's a lonely, lonely place. <clears throat> or think about other examples of loneliness. Suffering can also be a place of loneliness, especially if it feels like most people don't understand. So chronic pain can feel lonely. We've had more than one couple struggling with infertility come to Lighthouse because it seemed big enough where they could just come and hide because infertility is lonely. A broken relationship, divorce, the death of a loved one, they can all feel lonely. But on the other side of life, having a newborn can feel lonely. Your husband goes back to work, but you don't, and all of a sudden you are actually with the person for 24 hours a day, and yet you've never felt so lonely. Sometimes living out your faith can feel lonely. Have you ever been at work and you had to stand up for what you believe and you just wish that there was one other person on your side, one other person in the room who understood what you believed? But there's not, and so, you, so living out your faith can feel very lonely. For me, one particular group I've been praying for is the young people, high schoolers and middle schoolers. I've talked to more than one school administrator who said that many students are really struggling with loneliness in this season. And this isn't just because you're stuck at home. You may have already felt lonely because uh, you're different than your classmates, because you don't feel as gifted as others, because you feel like if someone were to really know you, I mean really know you, they wouldn't like you because of some sin or disappointment. I could go on and on. I had a whole list of ways we struggle with loneliness, the loneliness of loss, the loneliness of feeling misunderstood, the loneliness of jealousy, <clears throat> the loneliness of missing out the loneliness of failure. I took out a whole section on the loneliness of ministry and leadership because of time. But hopefully you see the point. It is, it is a very important topic, not just because COVID-19 and because of safer at home, but because loneliness is part of life. In fact, all of you fall into one of two categories. Either you are struggling with loneliness or you know someone who is struggling with loneliness. And because of that, all of us really need to think through how 
if Jesus really changes everything, he speaks into our loneliness as well. So here's our key idea. The gospel redeems our loneliness and uses it to bring us to Christ. Before I begin, let me offer one story of loneliness we see in scripture. The woman at the well from John chapter 4. My hoping that as we go through this message, her story will help us to think through how Jesus really speaks into our loneliness. To me, the woman at the well is this picture of someone feeling the sting of loneliness and seeking for something to bring her heart rest. If you don't know the story, Jesus meets a woman at the well. She was likely considered an immoral woman because she had been married five times and now was living with someone who is not her husband. That would be a a true disgrace in that culture. And because of this, she's an outcast, a prior in her own community. In fact, John includes some little facts to give us a window into her suffering. For example, it tells us that she comes to the well in the middle of the day, when it was the hottest. This was likely to avoid the other woman. She wouldn't have to hear the word whore whispered under their breath. She could avoid their condescending stares. So imagine that. She chooses to embrace aloneness over the loneliness of being an outcast. Beyond that, she's on her sixth man at least, so we know that she's looking for something in people. You can almost imagine with each new husband, she thinks, maybe this is the one. Maybe this is the one who will love me. Maybe this is the one who will value me and treat me like I want. Maybe with this one, I won't feel so alone. And so this is a woman well acquainted with loneliness. But though her loneliness is both real and powerful, her story illustrates the hope of the gospel that changes everything. So look at three ideas. Point number one, loneliness and the need for the gospel. Now, quick warning, this message is made for lonely people because of the focus of the content, but it's not made for lonely people in the amount of content. In other words, if right now you're going through the darkness of loneliness, the sheer depth and amount of teaching might feel overwhelming. But I encourage you to stay with me. And if you have to, over the course of this week, rewatch portions at a time to really digest the gospel truths that are transforming. Now, in a message like this, we, we might be tempted uh, to just skip to something like three ways to overcome our loneliness. And we will discuss practical application at the end. But to appreciate the power and practicality of the gospel when it comes to our loneliness, we must first consider that loneliness exists in part because God created us for relationships. In other words, we were made for relationships. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 It says this, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice the plural there. God said, let us make man in our image. Now, one of the fundamental truths of Christianity is that we believe in a triune God. We believe in one God who eternally exists in three persons. Meaning that from eternity past, God had existed in a perfect, loving community. And so humanity created in the image of a triune God has been created for community as well. In other words, again, we were made for relationships. This is why then in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, at which point only Adam existed, God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Why? Because Adam was created for community. Now this statement might be familiar to you, but understand that this is one of the most striking things said to this point in the creation account. Because up until this point, everything had been good. The earth was good, the plants were good, and the animals were good, but it was not good for man to be alone. And remember, this is before the fall and the advent of sin. So consider that before sin, in the paradise of Eden, there was something not good for man to be alone. Now understand, this was not about loneliness. Remember, loneliness is about the pain of feeling isolated, but since sin sin hasn't entered the story yet, neither has pain. At this point, Adam is experiencing perfect communion with God in the paradise of Eden. There is no pain. In fact, if you notice, God is the one that really has to bring up the reality that it's not good for man to be alone. In other words, this wasn't about Adam feeling lonely or looking for a wife. God points out it's not good for the man to be alone. So why then was it not good for man to be alone if he's not lonely? There are various reasons. And the most obvious example would be the need for another to procreate and fulfill the mandate to be fruitful and multiply. But significantly, for our purposes this morning, 
as Jonathan Holmes writes, none of us can be a community in ourselves the way God is a community in himself, meaning that we need others so that we can live out our design and image our triune God. Specifically, we need others to love and we need others to be built up in love. Now, I'll come back to this later, but notice I didn't say we need to be loved. That's what the world might say. We need people to fill some psychological deficit. We need people to uh, give us love or to help us find meaning or significance or respect or affection. But this is not what scripture says. We need others so that we can live out love and we need others so we can be built up in love. So where then there then does loneliness come in? Loneliness was introduced with the fall. The fall is that moment in history when sin entered our world Uh, Sin being not only the the wrong things we have done, but the disease that corrupts our nature. So whereas Adam had lived in perfect loving relationship with God and his wife Eve, sin ruined it all. That's what sin does. It divides, pollutes, destroys, condemns. And devastatingly, sin separates. It doesn't take much to see what sin does to our relationships, how it creates a divide between us and others. The sense of anger, jealousy, lust, discontentment, impatience, dishonesty, untrustworthiness, among a thousand others, wreak havoc on our relationships. And they mean that we no longer see people's opportunities to love, but a means to receive. In other words, we don't serve people, we use people. There are no perfect relationships. There's always some divide. But realize that our separation with others is not the first problem, nor the biggest problem. The separation we feel with others is rooted in our separation from God. That is sin's most devastating consequence. It separates sinful humanity from a holy God. It had to. God is perfect, righteous, he's holy. And so our sin is rebellion against God. It's hatred towards that which he stands for, the pursuit of our own kingdom over his. Sin then causes a separation with God and tells us that apart from a savior, we will be separated from him for eternity in hell. Loneliness, then, is the pain of feeling isolated and separated that was introduced with the advent of sin. But understand, ultimately, our loneliness is a desire to be with God. And so the world uh, feels lonely, not simply because they want to be with people, but whether they know it or not, it demonstrates the longing within each one of us to know God and be known by him. If you don't know Christ, and if you felt lonely, I pray that you'd realize that that longing is really a longing for Jesus. He is the one you were ultimately made for. Now we'll discuss the purpose and even the blessing of loneliness in a moment, but first understand that because loneliness is a result of the fall, we might come to the conclusion that loneliness is sinful, but it's not true. Anecdotally, if someone were to lose a spouse to death, we would be surprised if they weren't lonely. We, we, can, we can feel the loneliness of grief and yet still honor God, as it describes in 1 Thessalonians 4, a grieving with hope. But scripturally, I think the most convincing argument that loneliness doesn't have to be sinful is that Jesus was acquainted with loneliness. We could look at different moments in his life. He was, after all, in the desert by himself for 40 days. But we most clearly see this on the cross when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This word forsaken defined lexically as as to separate connection with someone or something. So in that moment, Jesus cries out because he felt intimately, like no one had ever before since, true loneliness. So the pain of loneliness is a result of the fall. But in and of itself, loneliness is not sinful. As we'll discuss in the next point, we can have a hopeful Christ-pursuing loneliness. That being said, loneliness can be sinful, and it can go down a dark path. So on one hand, we we can have a God-honoring loneliness, but on the other hand, we can have a loneliness that is rooted in sin, deepened by sin, or results in sin. Now, as a brief aside, this may be the last thing you want to hear, especially if you are feeling lonely. You might be thinking, great, I can't even be lonely without feeling guilty. Or maybe you think it just seems unkind, even insensitive, that in your pain, someone might point out the sin of loneliness. But understand that if we separate loneliness from sin, we potentially separate loneliness from the gospel that speaks into it. Because if loneliness is simply about proximity to people or personality or genetics, then we are stuck because the gospel doesn't promise to change those things. It doesn't promise perfect friends or a spouse 
or a better spouse or no suffering or no loss, but it does promise to defeat sin. That is what Christ does, offer victory over the sin that plagues us. Meaning, in this life, we will always feel a measure of pain from loneliness, but as the gospel defeats the sin that deepens that loneliness, loneliness then becomes a grace that leads us to Christ rather than away from him towards a path of darkness and despair. So loneliness doesn't have to be sinful, but it can be if it's rooted in sin, deepened by sin, or results in sin. Meaning that the questions of sinfulness, uh, the, uh, the sinfulness of loneliness become, is sin at the root of the pain? Is sin deepening the pain? Or is sin the response to the pain? So A in your notes, uh, by asking is sin at the root of the pain, I mean, where does the pain come from? Is it part of the natural grieving process? Or is it rooted in sin? For example, a loneliness that comes from angrily shutting everyone out of your life might be rooted in sin. B, by asking, is sin deepening the pain? I mean, how is sin making the pain of loneliness worse than it has to be? For example, there can be a loneliness to singleness. But by making marriage an idol, we can deepen that pain of loneliness. And third, by asking, is sin the response to the pain? I mean, how are you responding to it? Are you persevering through the pain with hope and faith, love and kindness? Or are you frustrated, bitter, lacking faith? I mean, just think of some of the sins of isolation, lust and pornography, anger and bitterness, hopelessness and despair. All this to say, loneliness does not have to be sinful and can even be embraced as a grace. But sin can also take it down a dark path. Right, this could be a long discussion, but let me offer at least a few examples of how our sin can be the cause of or deepen our loneliness. Because again, the better we understand the pain of loneliness, the better we can apply the gospel to that sorrow. So three of many ways that, that sin can be the cause of or deepen the pain of loneliness. First, in our loneliness, sin leads us to seeking false saviors. And by that I mean part of what makes loneliness painful is that we're seeking in people what we're meant to find in Christ. Like I mentioned earlier, we, we need people because we need to live out love and we need to be built up in love. But sin twists things so that rather than see people as an opportunity to love and serve, we see people as a means to get what we feel we need. We see people as a, a source of significance and meaning, pleasure and happiness, companionship and camaraderie, hope and identity. And with this comes loneliness, because people are meant to bear the weight of our soul's happiness. Again, we're seeking false saviors. We're, we're hoping people can offer what only Jesus truly can. One way to think of it is this. We should not seek in people what we're meant to find in Christ. We're meant to find our identity in Christ, not people. We're meant to find our meaning and purpose in Christ, not in people. We're meant to find our deepest joys in Christ, not in people. We're meant to find our true hope in Christ, not in people. As a simple example, think of the loneliness of singleness. Some of you are feeling it more acutely now than ever before. But in that pain, what might, uh, what might someone do, be tempted to do? Look for false saviors, specifically marriage. Many singles see loneliness as a result of singleness and marriage as the antidote. If only I got married, then I wouldn't feel so alone. If only I got married, then I wouldn't be so sad every time one of my friends got engaged or I saw pictures of a happy couple on social media. If only I got married, then I would feel like I'm worth something and that nothing is wrong with me. If only I got married, then I wouldn't struggle with lust and finally, I would know true intimacy. If only I got married, then I wouldn't have to uh, fear getting old alone. But do you see what's happening? The pain of loneliness has led to seeking in people what we're meant to find in Christ. Marriage has gone from a God-honoring desire to the pursuit of a false savior, a counterfeit God we are hoping will make our life right. And it only deepens the pain. B. Second, in our loneliness, sin can lead to a, a love of self over a love of God and others. Now our culture elevates self-love. My wife got an ad for a gym that said, better you, better wor world. Self-worship is truly the most selfless act of all. It's almost like the, the advertiser for the gym said, you know, there is some pastor who needs a layup of an illustration, and so let me write the most theologically incorrect, selfish ad I can. But this is the message of the world. But really, our love is meant to be directed upward to God and then overflow outward 
to others. That's why the two greatest commandments are love the Lord your God with all that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. But sin bends that love inward so that our pursuit isn't the glory of God and the good of others, but our own glory and our own good. And again, this, is, this truly deepens loneliness because life becomes about me. And when things don't go how I want, when people don't serve and love and value me like I want, I feel lonely. When life is constantly looking upward and outward, we have less opportunity to feel the pain of loneliness. But when we look inward, the pain is deepened. We don't seek to understand and serve others. We just constantly feel misunderstood. We don't live, find joy when others are in good relationships because we instead become bitter because we don't have the same. We don't look at, at a spouse as an opportunity to expend ourselves, but feel alone because they don't meet our needs. So sin can lead to self-centered love. Lastly, in our loneliness, sin can lead to fear. One author writes, loneliness has an ugly twin sister named fear. All of us are alone at times. But part of what can deepen loneliness is that we fear what it means. Will I always be lonely? Is something wrong with me? What if I never get married? What if I never feel happy again? What if I can't find someone to love me? What if uh, standing up for my faith costs me my job? What if my friends move on without me? What if my marriage never gets better? We've addressed fear in recent messages, both good and bad fear. But if you're struggling with loneliness, you must pause and consider how your fears play into it. Okay, so hopefully you have a better understanding of loneliness. But before we move on to the hope of the gospel, let's consider again the woman at the well. In light of what we just studied, we know that it's okay for her to feel lonely. That loneliness doesn't have to be a sin. We would be shocked if she didn't experience loneliness. But we also uh, would learn that her lo- longing to be with a husband was really about a longing for something greater. She believed the answer to her loneliness was, was people, right? Each husband being the new savior that she hoped would make life right. Jesus describes her craving as a thirst, a desire to be satisfied. And she tried to quench that thirst with man after man. With each one, she hoped that the longings in her heart would be satisfied, never realizing that her loneliness was more theological than anthropological. More than anything, it was expressed a longing for God. So with that in mind, let's look to the gospel and see how Jesus changes our loneliness. So point number two, loneliness and the power of the gospel. I think it's easy to see the antidote to loneliness being people. I mean, even as I was working on this, I thought, uh, as, I, uh, as I work on this, I thought, speaking of lonely, I should mention the interns. Right? They're single, they could use a, a wife. I could almost give an advertisement for them. But then I realized that that's a bit messed up. So I won't mention Gavin Lothian, Keith Fong, and Chris Wong as being godly men and very eligible bachelors. But again, it simply illustrates that this, it's easy to think that the solution to loneliness is another person. But really, the answer is Jesus. Now, you're likely not shocked that the answer to our loneliness is Jesus. I mean, he is the answer to just about everything. But you might consider it uh, theoretical more than helpful. Like, okay, it's nice that Jesus is the answer, but I could really just use someone to talk to. Well, let's think through the gospel and loneliness because it will lead us to seeing the grace in loneliness and the grace of loneliness. Now, remember what we mentioned earlier. The problem of the fall was separation. By that I mean not only relational strife between humans, but more significantly, the separation between God and man. And from this, we see one of the great themes of the Bible, the presence of God. We believe in a God who draws near. And so if you were to do a study of the the whole Bible, that theme would come out. I mean, in the beginning, Adam and Eve knew the unhindered presence of God. With the fall, that presence is lost as man is separated from God. But in that moment, we see God's plan unfold to bring us back into relationship with him. If we had time, we could trace the theme of the presence of God through the rest of the Old Testament. And then we would come to the birth of Jesus. And do you remember what he is called? Emmanuel, meaning God with us. But understand, this was more than Jesus just being with humans. He was on a mission to bring humanity back to God. But to save humanity... Jesus would have to take on humanity. So understand, when Jesus entered our world for the first time in his eternal existence, he would experience suffering, including 
loneliness. This is how Isaiah would paint the picture in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 2 and 3. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. It's a picture of many things, but in particular, consider the loneliness, despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. And we see glimpses of that loneliness throughout his life. At times, he was rejected by his own family. Remember, they thought he was crazy, right? That's got to feel a bit lonely. His hometown wanted to throw him off a cliff. He was abandoned by his own disciples in, his, in this time of greatest need. I mean, but, but think about that. Even before we, we get into the purpose of all of it, we should find comfort in the reality that Jesus understands loneliness. If you're lonely, don't ever believe the lie that Jesus doesn't get it, that he can't relate to the pain of feeling isolated. As Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And yet understand, Jesus wouldn't ultimately experience loneliness for the purpose of empathy. He would embrace loneliness for the purpose of rescue. Because the glimpses of loneliness Jesus experienced during his lifetime were simply precursors to the loneliest moment in history, the cross of Christ. <clears throat> Remember that when Jesus went to the cross, it was to endure the wrath of God for the sins of believers. As 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. So understand the, the, the picture. We deserve God's wrath because we are sinners. We deserve to suffer and be eternally separated from his grace and love. But Jesus went to the cross and stood in the place of every believer for all of time. Meaning that Jesus was treated like he had lived my life with all its ugliness and sin so that God could treat me like I lived his life and call me his child. But what this meant was that on the cross, the perfect community of love that Jesus had experienced with the Father since before time began was shattered. And that's why he cried out in Matthew 27, 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, like I mentioned earlier, it was the acknowledgement that he felt abandoned by God as he took the weight of sin and suffered for it. But understand that Jesus endured the greatest moment of loneliness in history so that we would never have to. John Bloom puts it this way. Jesus doesn't merely understand your loneliness. He's destroying it. Because he bore that's the sin that estranged and alienated you from God and died on your behalf, you are no longer truly a stranger or alien, but you are a fellow citizen with the saints and a member of God's family. Jesus did what, he, what we could not do on our own. He brought us back to God. Now, if we had more time, we could continue to trace that theme of the presence of God right until the very end of the story. Because in Revelation, the Bible ends where it began, with the presence of God. Revelation 21.3 says this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. So paradise has been restored and made even better, as believers know the very real, very loving presence of God. And what this means is that the gospel says that, that the pain of loneliness, no matter how deep it is, is temporary. Loneliness, then, is this homesickness of sorts, this longing that will be fulfilled when we are finally at home with God one day. Beloved, this is where we are headed. And yet, that all being said, please don't understand the gospel message as being uh, just wait until you die and go to heaven because then you won't feel lonely anymore. The gospel speaks to the pain of loneliness that you feel right now. First of all, again, God is with you. Whatever you feel, however dark your world seems, God is with you. He draws near to you. Beyond that, the gospel specifically addresses those struggles we mentioned earlier, those struggles that deepen our loneliness. So let's, take a brief, let's briefly take a look at, at that and, and see how the gospel addresses our loneliness. So first, in our loneliness, sin can lead to seeking false saviors. 
but the gospel allows loneliness to point us to Christ, the true Savior. We are made by God and for God, and so only in him will we find the deepest longings of our heart. Meaning that the longings and sufferings of this world should remind us that we are made for something more. Steve DeWitt writes, Loneliness acts like a divine sticky note that says, don't forget for whom you were made. Think of it this way, that the sin and struggles of this world are meant to encourage us to long for Christ. We discussed this a few weeks ago, but we're meant to have this godly discontent with this world. The way the Bible Bible describes it is a groaning, 2 Corinthians 5.2, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Romans 8.23, And not only the the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So most of us are familiar with groaning, the groaning of complaining, of, of wanting more in this world. But we're actually meant to groan in our longing for Christ and in our longing for the next world. So slow down and take that in. The difficulties and sufferings of this world, including loneliness are meant to lead us to a longing for Jesus. We discussed this idea when we studied fasting. Eating is this ongoing illustration of satisfying our hunger, but it's meant to point to to the satisfaction we find in Christ. And this starts to make sense of fasting in the Bible. It usually was about a longing for, a desire for, a hunger for God. And so fasting is meant to discipline our hearts to hunger for God more than anything else. And loneliness is the same idea. It's a fast, if you will, from relationships, whether it's one we have chosen or one that's been thrust upon us. But in this loneliness, this desire to be in relationship and to feel connected with others, it should remind us that we were made for God. It should build in us a greater longing for him. Again, Steve DeWitt writes, we look at loneliness as an enemy to be avoided at all cost. But this side of redemption's consummation, our lives will never be free from loneliness. God uses it to get our attention. In this way, loneliness ceases to be a devil to us, actually becomes a guide and a friend. But this is only true when we respond to it in the way that God intends. If we go on a shopping spree or eat chocolates or sit and stew with the person who left us, we stunt loneliness's profound ability to deepen our walk with God. Some of you are are people or you know people who are serial daters or always feeling like their friends have failed them. They struggle with pornography or overeating. But often they are trying to fill their heart and numb it to the pain of loneliness, never considering that the loneliness is meant to lead them to Christ. Elizabeth Elliot, who suffered the martyrdom of her husband while on missions, wrote this. Our loneliness cannot always be fixed, but it can always be accepted as the very will of God for right now. And that turns it into something beautiful. Perhaps it is like the field wherein lies the valuable treasure. We must buy the field. It's no sun-drenched meadow embroidered with wildflowers. It's a bleak and empty place. But once we know it contains a jewel, the whole picture changes. The empty scrap of forgotten land suddenly teems with possibility. And when, through a willed act, we receive this thing we did not want, then loneliness, the name of the hidden field nobody wants, is transformed into a place of hidden treasure. So let me ask you, are you letting your loneliness lead you to Christ? And are you letting it create a greater longing for him? Or are you numbing the pain through media intake and indulgences? Are you trying to rid yourself of loneliness through the pursuit of the right person who can meet all your needs? Are you angry and bitter because people keep failing you? Can I encourage you to go to Christ? He is the one that you were made for. Second, be in your notes. In our loneliness, sin can lead to a love of self over a love of God and others, but the gospel frees us from our inward bend so that we can find joy in loving God and others. Sin is bondage, and so is selfishness. It promises happiness, offers fleeting moments of it, but in the end, it will always bring grief to our hearts. The gospel, then, is not simply about helping us do what is right, but pursuing what is better. Something you've heard me say over and over is that the gospel frees us from our inward bend. It takes the love we direct towards ourselves and frees us to love God and let that love overflow into a love for others. And in that upward and outward looking love, the pain of loneliness is lessened. As Jesus said, it is, be- it is more blessed to give than to receive. When we are consumed with the joy of loving and serving others, it can overshadow much of the pain of our loneliness. Most of us know people like this. 
And looking at the lies, we would understand that they are lonely, but in their love for others, they find such contentment. We must believe there is a deeper joy in loving well than in being loved well. That means no longer do we need to use people to meet our needs, but we can be thankful to meet theirs. We can take joy in the relationships of others, finding happiness in their happiness. We don't constantly feel misunderstood because we're more concerned with understanding them and serving them. So with an upward and outward uh, love, those times of of being alone don't don't have to be immediately filled with the pain of loneliness. Those times can be spent with our Lord, the lover of our soul. We can pray for others, wanting God to be gracious to them. We can seek ways to serve, seeing alone time as extra time to invest in blessing people. So let me ask you, are you looking inward or upward and outward? And how might you, even this week, in a season of isolation, seek to better love God and others? For those of you in struggling marriages, can I encourage you to look out? In our pain, it's hard to look anywhere but at ourselves. But look out in love and believe God can be gracious through that. Lastly, C. In our loneliness, sin can lead to fear, but the gospel alleviates the lies of fear with the truths of Christ. What do you fear in your loneliness? That something in you is wrong, different, unlovable? The gospel tells you you were made by God in the image of God for God. And importantly, you are loved. As it says in Romans 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Absolutely nothing. In the loneliness of living at your faith at work, what do you fear? Do you fear the loss of reputation or friends or advancement? The gospel tells you that everything can be considered loss compared to knowing Christ Jesus. Whatever we lose is rubbish compared to knowing and being known by Jesus. Do you fear that you're stuck in a marriage that will never change? Maybe you feel like your spouse can never change or you feel like you can never change. The gospel tells us Christ can change anyone. Meaning, at the very least, that as you humbly invite grace, God can transform your heart and bring you hope and even joy in the midst of a difficult marriage. There's more, but as you consider your loneliness, consider your fears, and then go to scripture and consider how the truths of the gospel speak to those fears. Before we move on to practical application, let us visit again our woman at the well. Like we said, she is a woman who longs. As Jesus describes, she thirsts. And yet husband after husband has failed to quench that thirst. So she continues to seek. She's even willing to be a prior in her own community with the hopes that one day she will find the one. So what does Jesus say to her? You just haven't found the right man yet. You need to love yourself. You need better friends. You just have to suck it up and do the right thing. He tells her, that he is the living water that can satisfy her spiritual thirst. John 4, 13 and 14 says this, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Her longing is ultimately a longing for him. And until she puts her faith in him, she will drink the salt water of the world that the world offers that always leaves her thirstier than before. But if she believes, if she looks to him, she could find the peace her heart seeks. Her thirst would be quenched, her longing satisfied, and her heart could rest. Point number three, loneliness and the application of the gospel. As we close our time, I wanted to consider how we might practically apply the gospel. And before we discuss loneliness, let's briefly address aloneness. And though it can't always be avoided, especially in a time like this, let me offer one encouragement. Battle aloneness with Christ-centered community. So remember, there's a difference between loneliness and aloneness, but the two often go hand in hand. And something that can exasperate our loneliness is not having real Christian friends walking with us through life. Remember, we need people to demonstrate our love to, and we need those who will build us up in love. So we need to embrace the community that God has given us. You you may struggle in your singleness or because your family has disowned you or because your spouse isn't a believer. But remember, when we became Christians, Jesus expanded our families. The church is meant to be our primary community, the place where we live out our faith 
and build up one another in love. Now you may feel like this is the problem. You don't have enough Christian friends or good Christian friends. You might even be tempted to judge the church family. Why don't people reach out to me more often? Why are they not welcoming me? Why aren't they willing to spend more time with me? But if you lack Christian brothers or sisters, can I ask you, are you waiting or are you pursuing? Because both set a precedence. Waiting sets the precedence. Relationships are about me. Pursuing sets the precedence. The relationships are about God and loving others. I've seen both kinds of people at Lighthouse, those that wait and wonder when people will love them. And then there are those who come on the first Sunday, they seek to love others. You can probably guess which ones tend to thrive. So pursue relationships with the church family. Like was mentioned earlier, there'll be a brief time of Zoom hangouts after service next Sunday. Could you be a part of that? Could you call or text a friend? Could you join us for our prayer meeting? Could you invite someone to a meal over the internet? Prioritize community. Can I offer a special encouragement to the young people? You may really miss your friends from school or from your team or or from whatever. Can Can I challenge you to lean into your church community? Unbelieving friends are nice. They can be fun to hang out with, but they will never be what you truly need. You need people pointing you to Christ. As one author writes, friendships are for the purpose of glorifying God encouraging others, showing love and compassion, and gaining encouragement to do what is right. So for everyone, even amidst a season like this, pursue Christ-centered community. Now let's look at loneliness. And here's where we're going to get practical. And yet I'm not going to offer you you three ways to overcome your loneliness. As much as, as we will look at ways in which we can redeem loneliness and battle the sin that deepens that loneliness. By redeem, I don't mean buy back, but to free it from the consequences of sin through the gospel. Okay, so let's look at five ways to redeem our loneliness. And I also try to offer a few encouragements to those of you who are trying to love the lonely. So A, let your loneliness reveal your heart. Your loneliness says something about you. It doesn't have to be bad, but it does reveal your heart. And so rather than treat it simply as a problem to be solved, see it as a grace that allows you to know your heart better so that you can pursue Christ better. What does your loneliness reveal about what you believe, what you worship, what you find meaning and purpose in, how you understand love? Take time this week and consider your heart. And the reason that this is important is that the better you know your heart, the easier it will be to apply the gospel and move towards Christ in faith. If you are ministering to someone who is lonely, understanding their circumstances is usually fairly easy. But the work of a faithful friend means trying to understand their heart. Because it's there, you'll better know how to apply the gospel. B, counter the lies of loneliness with the truths of scripture. So you let loneliness reveal your heart. Now what do you do with it? One thing is to let the truths of scripture counter the lies you're tempted to believe. Consider these potential lies. No one understands my suffering. I will always be lonely until my spouse loves me like I deserve. The antidote to loneliness is people. If I can just find a boyfriend or get married or have a kid, then I won't be so lonely. If you believe these, it will deepen the pain. And so you must counter them with the truths of scripture. Now again, if you're ministering to someone who is lonely, be present, be with them, but don't only be present. Because the cure for their loneliness isn't you. It's Christ. And so you need to speak gospel truth into their lives. C, let loneliness lead to a longing for Christ. We've already talked about this, but loneliness is wasted if it doesn't lead you to Jesus. I read passages earlier in Paul's groaning, his godly discontent with this world that led to a longing for the next. But if your groaning is simply complaining, then your loneliness will fail in its purpose to lead you to Jesus. So in those moments of experiencing the pain of loneliness, draw near to God. Let your desire to be with others remind you that you were made for another. Let it create in you a longing to know and love Jesus better. And if you're ministering to someone who's lonely, always remember your goal. It's to get them to Jesus. Again, be a friend, be present, listen, love. But don't forget why you were there to point them to Christ. D, feel your faith and worship, not your loneliness. 
Again, this is something we've talked about before, but we need to fuel our faith in worship. We need to give it something to feed on, something to help it grow. Unfortunately, too often we're fueling our loneliness. Imagine two people. The first is constantly looking at Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and TikTok and wondering why their life is not as good as everyone else seems to be. They, they think often about what they wish they had. They lie awake at night, coveting relationships. On the other hand, imagine the person who is in the word, who goes through, it, goes through it so that it would go through them. Imagine them listening to sermons online and, and living lives of faithful service in the church, of committing to small group, of constantly reading good Christian books. Which one do you think is going to struggle more with loneliness? And I'm not saying that this, because, this is because God will give good things to the one who is more godly. Simply that as we fuel our faith in him over our faith in our idols, we live with a greater sense of joy and peace. Personally, I don't think social media is a sin, but I do think some of you would do well to get off of it because it's serving as a means to fuel your idolatry and loneliness. Someone was telling me that at a Christian university, there, was a, there has been a significant uptick in students on medication for depression directly related to social media. Again, I don't think it has to be bad, but some of you would do really well to, to at the very least take a fast and spend that time with the Lord, fueling your faith in him. Again, if you're ministering to someone who is lonely, provide them with better fuel. Encourage them and even teach them how to fuel their faith over their sin and their idolatry. Lastly, E, fight the inward gaze by looking outward. The idea here isn't to distract yourself from your loneliness, like maybe if I keep myself really busy, then I won't notice that I'm so lonely. The idea is that if I'm looking upward and outward in love, like I'm designed to, and I'm not, then I'm not spending that time loving myself. And so in that outward look, looking love, I'm finding the joy of living as God designed me. I'm guessing some of you know people in difficult marriages, and yet because they are constantly looking outward, they're still joyful. Some of you know singles who are so heavily invested in serving and loving others, they have little time to wallow in the pain of their isolation. Some of you know people who have lost loved ones, people who have gone through a divorce, People have felt the sting of rejection. But because their love is first upward and then outward, nothing can diminish their peace and joy. If you're struggling with inward gaze, how can you love others? Who can you invest in? How can you serve and expand, your, and expand yourself in joy? And if you're ministering to someone who is lonely, encourage them to love, but also help them to love. In other words, love people together and help draw their gaze upward to God and outward to others. Before I close, if this is you, if you're lonely, can I encourage you to let the church family walk with you? Not simply so that, you, you, that our company means that you won't be so lonely. After all, we're not the antidote to your loneliness. Let us walk with you so that we can point you to Christ and journey with you as we meet him together. So please don't struggle alone. Reach out to your small group leader or your fellowship group leader. If you're a student, talk to your youth advisor. Whoever it is, don't walk in darkness, but overcome aloneness with community and let us help you overcome loneliness with Christ. Let me close with this. Let's uh, one more time uh, look, consider the woman at the well. As we read the end of the story, we find out that she does believe. She trusts Christ. And in what I think is one of the more beautiful parts of the story, she tells others about Jesus. But think about that. In the beginning of the story, she avoided people. She embraced aloneness to avoid the loneliness of being an outcast. But then she finds Jesus. She drinks the living water that finally quenches that thirst she has felt for so long. And rather than move away from people, she moves toward them. Rather than pursuing a man to meet her needs, she can move towards others to tell them about the one that they need. Rather than the loneliness that comes from fear and failure and sin, from being an outcast, she knew the joy of forgiveness and the presence of God and having her heart's longings met in Christ. And her whole life was transformed. She went to people and told them about Jesus. Beloved, the same can be true for you. Let the pain of loneliness lead you to Christ and let him give you the peace that you seek. Will you pray with me? Dearly Father, we thank you and praise you and 
Lord, I know that some right now sit in their homes and they are so discouraged and so lonely. But Lord, let their loneliness draw them to you. May they know your presence. May they know that Jesus died so that they would never have to be alone again. And Lord, as they look to you in love, as they look to others in love, may you find them, help them to find joy amidst their loneliness. We thank you. We love you. We praise you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we think about the presence of God and how it transforms our loneliness, it's fitting that we take communion together. Communion is a visible and physical reminder of Jesus' promises that he will never leave us or forsake us, that the work of his gospel will continue to transform us. And while it is unusual that we're taking communion in this way, the community significance of the Lord's Supper is not bound by someone physically sitting right next to us, but in the spiritual union that we share in Christ. And while we take the elements in our homes, we know we are joining our Lighthouse brothers and sisters in proclaiming the death of Christ as we take communion together. Now, you don't have to be a member at Lighthouse to take communion with us, but you must be a believer in Christ. The Bible is very clear about who is able to take communion, and it is something that is reserved for followers of Jesus. And if you're not a Christian, we'd invite you to consider who Jesus is and what it would mean for you to place your faith in him for salvation. The Apostle Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 11 regarding communion. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if you have your elements, we'll sing a song together and you can take that time to reflect and repent and come before the Lord. At the end of that song, we'll come together again and we'll take the elements together.
the body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you that because he was separated from you on the cross, that we will never have to be. And because of his work in the gospel, we have a relationship with you and you promise that you will be with us forever. God, we pray that as we have taken communion together, that you would use it as a visible reminder to us that you are a God who is ever present, ever faithful, ever true to us. And that God, that you are a great comfort to us in our loneliness. Lord, we thank you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's sing one more song together. I once was lost in darkest night. Yes, thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy and led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse.
Now receive the blessing of the benediction. It comes from Romans 15. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for joining us this week. Don't forget to post photos of your household worshiping using the hashtag Lighthouse Worship at home. Have a blessed week. Right, man. This is awesome. <laughs>